recording. There we go. All right, so we are recording right now. Um, and this is the module that we are on right now. Okay, we are talking about uh, injection, surjection, and also bijection. In your other math classes, some of these terms may have slightly different names, but these are the terms and these are the names that I go by in this class. So that means you, know, you have to kind of understand these terms, you know, in this class. All right, so now we, we talked about injection already, and I went through a few examples of injection. So are there any questions about injection that you guys want to talk about or ask about? No questions, okay. All right, so one thing you can do, okay, you know, when you're studying is to think about examples, okay? This is a subset of the Cartesian product between the domain and the codomain. And then you ask the question, first of all, is this even a function to begin with? And if it is a function, is it in injective? At least it'll go, you know, cover up to this part, which is section two. So those are things that you can do on your own. Now, if you're saying, okay, but I'm not sure, okay, you know, I created this you know, subset of the Cartesian product between the domain and the codomain, but I'm not really sure whether this is injection or not, or whether this is even a function or not, you can always email and contact me or come to my office hour, and I can then take a look at your example and explain to you whether it is a function or not, and if it is, if it is a function, is it injective or not. But coming up with examples is one way that you can you know, you know, kind of deepen your understanding or at least find out what you do not understand yet. Because you know, if, you come if, if you get to your own example and you're not really sure about the answer, that means you're not really 100% sure about how things are defined, which is a great thing, okay? Discovering what you do not understand is a great thing. All right, so I just want to kind of cover this kind of stuff you know, early on. Um, because you know um, this is how you know you can read the modules and be able to kind of confirm whether you have a grasp on the concepts or not. So without any questions about injection, we are moving on to surjection. So I found that you know this uh, tablet you know, can actually display. Oh, maybe. In, oh, it does that. Okay. So I cannot see the little circle, kind of like the prompt, you know, on my screen, but it it does appear on the projector. So it says you know, a surjective function, aka surjection. So surjection you know, covers both surjective and function at the same time. It's a function where every element in the codomain is mapped to. Okay. So what exactly does that mean? Okay, so you know, maybe a few examples can be helpful. So that's one thing about examples is you, know, you can come up with some examples and then you ask yourself, so are these in fact injections or not? Okay, so we are going to talk about a few examples. Um, there are a few, you know, I think in my notes too, there we go. So we'll take a look at the example you know, at, the, at the end of this section. So the first thing is um, we want to look, take a look at these notations. So the question is, what is this telling us? Okay, can someone you know, tell me what that represents? Let me use the mouse pointer, it's easier to use the mouse pointer, there we go. What does that mean? So we are assuming, uh, this is an assumption, which means I am asserting, I'm assuming that this particular thing is true. This is something that is Boolean, it is, but I'm assuming it is true. But what exactly am I assuming that is true? What is this notation? Exactly. So I'm confirming that it is a function to begin with. Now, what is mapped to what? I do not know, okay? This does not tell us you know, what is mapped to what. So in this case, um, if I use this as the actual function, um, then it is, okay. With this one, okay, first of all, with this particular setup, is it even possible to have a surjection? 
And if not, why not? I mean, the paragraph actually kind of explains that too, but I want you guys to tell me why is it not possible to have a surjection when f is a function where the domain is a, b, and the codomain is 1, 2, and 3. Yep. So there are two things you know, that are important here. The first one is actually really important, is what makes a function a function. What makes a function a function is every element in the domain has to map to one and only one item in the codomain. Is that okay? So that means the number of mapping or the number of elements in the codomain that are mapped to that number has to be less than or equal to the number of elements in the domain. Okay, does anyone want me to repeat that sentence? Because I just said a long sentence with a lot of very specific terms. Yes. I will try because you know, usually when the words come out of my mouth, it's not in my head anymore. So it's really hard for me to you know, say the same thing again, exactly the same, but I can try. So a function, a two, okay, a subset of the Cartesian product between the domain and the codomain is a function if and only if every element in the domain maps to one and only one element in the codomain. As a result of that, the number of elements in the codomain that are mapped to has to be less than or equal to the number of elements in the domain. How am I doing? Is that kind of about right? Okay. So, given that is the case, can someone tell me how many elements do we have in the domain here? Two. So, based on what I just said, the number of elements in the codomain that can be mapped to has to be less than or equal to two. And there are three of those, you know, those things here, which means there's one guaranteed not to be mapped to. It doesn't matter how I make the actual function, one of the elements in the codomain cannot be mapped to. And as a result, because you know, in order for a function to be a surjection, every element in the codomain must be mapped to. So that means in this particular case where the mouse pointer is, f cannot possibly be a surjection. Simply because there are more elements in the codomain than there are elements in the domain. Is that okay? Just kind of intuitively, are we? Yeah. Say that one more time, so, sorry. Um, in that case, it is guaranteed not to be injective. Yep, because injection wants every element in the domain to map to a unique element in the codomain. So when you have more elements in the domain than there are elements in the codomain, then you cannot, you can, you, you're guaranteed to have to reuse one of the elements, at least one element in the codomain. Does that make sense? Uh, this is also based on the pigeonhole principle. Does anyone know what is the pigeonhole principle? You have more pigeons than there are pigeonholes. So when all the pigeons come home you know, in the evening, then at least one pigeonhole is gonna end up with more than one pigeons. Okay, does that make sense to you? How do you prove it? <laughs> it's hard to prove, okay? It, as intuitive as it is, this is one of those things where you have to prove by contradiction. We will talk about con proof by contradiction in this class later on, okay? But the pigeonhole principle works in the case of you know, proving that a function cannot be injective when there are more elements in the domain than there are elements in the codomain. But in this case, if there are more elements in the codomain than there are elements in the domain, then the function is guaranteed not to be a surjection because the requirement to be a surjection is every element in the codomain must be mapped to. All right, so let's look at something that is hopeful, okay? There's a possibility 
that this particular function is a surjection because I have the same number of elements in the domain as well as in the codomain. But in this case, I can still make it not a surjection because if I map A and B both to one, then two in the codomain is not mapped to, and as a result, you know, this F is not a surjection. It is also not an injection anymore because in order for a function to be an injection, every element in the domain has to map to a unique element in the codomain, but in this case, I'm mapping both A and B to one, which means it is not unique anymore. Yes? If I were to remove the two, in, in this case, right, in the bottom case, yeah. if the codomain consists only with one, then it would be a surjection, yes. But typically, you do not have the flexibility to change the codomain or the membership of the codomain or the membership of the domain when we <laughs> consider you know, whether something is injective or surjective or bijective. All right, so intuitively, you know, okay, let me, let me kind of pause here. Do we have any questions about intuitively what surjection means? Because if there are any questions, now is a good time to ask before I kind of give you the really cryptic way to describe what a surjection is. Going once, going twice. All right, you guys are sewed. Okay, so now we go back <laughs> and look at the kind of obscure way of describing it. So there are two ways to describe a function being a surjection. Now, we have to know that f is a function to begin with, okay? Because, you know, if f is not even known to be a function, I don't even care about whether it's a surjection or not. So these two statements here are only useful once we have already confirmed that f is a function. So once we know that f is a function, let's take a look at the top one and, and try to interpret what it's trying to say. What is this symbol again? For all, which is a universal quantifier, which means whatever is specified here has to be true for every element in y, and y in this case is the codomain. All right, so this is basically saying for every element q in the codomain, the following has to be true in order for f to be a uh, surjection. So what has to be true? There exists a p in the domain such that f of p equals to q. That's it. That's one way to say it, okay? You're basically saying from the perspective of the codomain, every element in the codomain, you know, has to be mapped to from something, at least one thing in the domain. Can everything, you know, if there's only one element in the codomain, can everything map to that thing? Yeah, it's not a problem. It's just that we have to make sure that there's at least one thing in the domain that maps to that thing in the codomain. And this has to be true for everything in the codomain. So that's one way to do it. The second way to do it is the second statement here. Um, oops, right here. So the second statement is a little bit more cryptic, but in a certain way, it is actually kind of nice too. Once again, we start with for every element Q in Y, the following has to be true. So what has to be true? So this time, you know, we do the same trick. We read the parentheses or parenthesized expression from the outside in. We're comparing to one, okay? You know, something has to be greater than or equal to one. And the question is, what has to be greater than or equal to one? So we look at the bar bar notation here. That is cardinality, which means you know, I'm counting the number of elements in whatever is specified between the bar and bar. The set that I'm creating here is made out of tuples, you know, P and Q, you know, being so each element in this particular set is in the format of a two tuple. Q is already decided from the outside, okay? So Q is already fixed by the time we get to the construction of this particular set. What is not determined is P. I have freedom to choose the, to any two tuple in F where the second item in the two tuple is Q. So, and then I do a count of how many elements there are in this particular set. It has to be greater than or equal to one. 
So it really is saying exactly the same thing as the first statement, but it looks at the whole thing in a slightly different way. The first way, which is where the mouse pointer is, is using the conventional way of looking at a, at a function. And the second way is to look at the function as a particular set. And then we are only looking, we're filtering membership in the set and counting the two tuples that we are interested in. And the tuples that we are interested in are the ones that map to a specific value Q from some value from the domain. So they really mean exactly the same thing. So we're we still doing okay so far with uh, the discussion. So we talked about injection. We talked about, you know, just then, we talked about surjection. So the last one that we are going to talk about is bijection. Bijection is very easy to, you know, define. Okay, I'm going to use the mouse pointer again. A bijective function, aka a bijection, is a function that is both injective and surjective. In other words, the whole point of defining injection is not really so much that injection by itself is really that useful, okay? It might be useful in some cases, but it's not that useful. Uh, surjection, eh, also, you know, it's kind of interesting, but by itself is also not exactly that interesting. But when you have a function that is both injective and surjective, then it becomes really interesting, okay? So we'll take a look at how we express, you know, in, uh, by injection, and then how we express surjection, and then how do we combine that? So I'm going to scroll back to an earlier screen, and I'm going to highlight a portion of it. All right. So I'm going to go all the way back to injection. As you can see, section two is about injection. And one way to specify that a function is injective is I'm going to use the highlight tool here. This thing here. Okay. So you look at this and go like, okay, you know, looks really familiar. Isn't that the same thing that we looked at a little bit earlier? No, they're not exactly the same. They're off by a little bit. This one qualifies a function as an injection. The one that qualifies a function as a surjection is down here. Okay. There we go. There's a little lag between you know, when I do things and when it appears on the screen. Can someone tell me how they're different? Exactly. So I'm pretty sure the, the other people you know, notice it basically the same thing. Okay, One specifies less than or equal to. The other one specifies greater than or equal to. So when I say a function is both injective and surjective, that means this chunk here, okay, everything else is the same, except it has to be less than or equal to one and greater than or equal to one. What is greater than or equal to one and less than or equal to one? It has to be one itself, right? So that means we have in uh, bijection, we have this. It has to equal to one. And someone's going to say, but hold on a second here, Tack. Isn't this what um, a function is? Isn't this what make a function a function? Do you guys remember how, what makes a function a function? Okay, so I'm going to quote, you know, the, I'm going to rewrite, you know, that portion, you know, you know, what makes a function a function. Yes, go ahead. Yep. So in this case here, we can say for every P in the domain, which is X, the following has to be true. The number of elements in the set where PQ is the format of a tuple in a member such that PQ is in F, you know, because I'm looking at F as a function, as a, as a set. <coughs> this particular set, the cardinality of this has to be one. Okay, so this is what makes a function f, or what it, this is what makes f as a subset of a Cartesian product between x and y a function. Are we still doing okay so far? 
I'm hoping you know, some of you go like, oh yeah, I remember where to find this thing here. Because you know, this thing was discussed when we were just talking about what makes a function a function. So you compare what is highlighted here and what I just hand wrote here, you go like, isn't that the same thing? They're not exactly the same thing. Or are they? What does one imply the other one? What do you think? Okay. Now, given that f has to be a function to begin with, well, okay. So this is already saying that it is a function. Okay. So so let's not even assume that f is a function. If both if this is true, does it imply this is true? It does not. Okay. Because if it does, then we wouldn't need that whole discussion of injection and surjection. Okay, so these two are two different things. But what is interesting about this is when we have a bijection, it is, it is guaranteed to have what we call an inverse function. Can someone tell me what is an inverse function just from math, from algebra? Go ahead. Okay, so that means if you give me the result of the application of the function, I know what value you start off, started off with, right? Okay, so let's take a look at you know, what is an inverse function because this is actually really important. So the inverse function you know, goes like this. So if we have a bijection f to begin with, okay? So in this case, I'm telling you, I'm asserting that f is not just a function, it is a bijection, okay? So from the perspective of the set F, X is the domain, Y is a codomain, but it is a bijection. Then it is guaranteed that you have another bijection that we call you know, F, okay, I know you guys cannot see it because you know, the, uh, it has to do with you know, how the pixels are displayed on the screen, but the, this is F inverse, okay? F you know, superscript negative one. So the F inverse is another bijection, but this time from the perspective of F inverse, Y becomes the domain and X becomes the codomain. Are we doing okay so far with this? Okay, so let's go through an example, okay? You know, because your know, examples are usually helpful and I'm, I'm just gonna write it on this you know, document here. So we'll do something that's simple. Okay, let's say X is AB, and let's say Y is one, two, okay? And we are gonna say, you know, F is a set that maps B to one and A to two. Okay, so we'll take a pause right here. And the first question is, given that is how we define the set A, uh, X and the set Y, is F a function? Well, first of all, is it a subset of the Cartesian product of X and Y? Are you guys all convinced that the first element you know, of everything in F comes from X? Are we all convinced that the second element of each two tuple of F comes from Y? Yep, okay, so I think we are fairly sure that F is a subset of X Cartesian product with Y, okay? So that's always good, you know, because if X, if F is not even a subset of the Cartesian product between X and Y, I don't have to think any further. F cannot possibly be a function uh, with X as a domain and Y as a codomain. Okay, good. So the next question is, is F a injection? Does it map everything in the domain to a unique element in the codomain? Yeah, I think so. I mean, one and two are not the same. And as a result, you know, it does map, you know, uh, the elements in the domain to different elements in the codomain, unique elements in the codomain. Okay, excellent. Is it a surjection? Is everything in the codomain mapped to? Looks that way, right? I mean, the codomain Y has one and two. We can see that one is mapped from B, two is mapped from A, and they're all used up. Okay, there's nothing in the codomain that is not mapped to. So as a result, F is a bijection. 
Are we good with that? All right. So now we're going to define the inverse. Okay. So I'm going to claim, okay, F inverse is another set of two tuples, except everything looks backwards. All right. So if you look at F inverse as just a set of two tuples, you go like, huh, it looks like um, if I were to look at F inverse as a function, then the domain looks like it's just one, two. If I were to look at the codomain, I can make that codomain just AB. Does that make sense? Okay. So that means, you know, in this case, I can say that F. Uh, F inverse is mapping Y to X. And once again, it is a bijection. It is a bijection because, you know, um, are we mapping everything in Y to unique elements in X? Yeah. One maps to B, two maps to A. They're definitely not mapping to the same thing. Okay. It's an injection. Is it a surge action? In other words, is everything in the codomain mapped to? Well, the codomain X in this case has the elements A and B. I can see that B is mapped from A1, A is mapped from two, so they are both mapped to. In other words, F inverse is also a surjection. It is an injection, it is a surjection, it is a bijection. So not only do we have the original F being a bijection, this inverse that we construct out of the original function is also a bijection. It goes in both directions. Are we doing okay so far with the example? Okay, all right. All right, so um, the rest of this is, is has to do with um, the definition and also you know, really just kind of the consequence of you know, doing all of this stuff here. So let me go to the last slide. Okay. So, uh, so basically, this is a formalized way to looking at a uh, F inverse is, a, uh, is also a bijection. So what we did earlier was a, an example. This one is more of a proof. Yes? So your, your stands for injection, not a surjection? An injection not being a surjection? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You just need to have more elements in the codomain than there are elements in the domain. It is still a function. Yeah. Okay, I can give you an example. So let's say f is a function um, from x to y. x is 1, 2. y is a, b, c. And then I can make f equal to the set of 1, a, um, b, 2. So it is injective, but it is not surjective. So that's just an example. Yep. So I'm going to erase the example because you know, it's a little bit out of the context of bijection. Yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. It is not a bijection. No, it does not have an inverse. It cannot be. So when you make an inverse or when you attempt to make an inverse, what you're doing is you're flipping all the tuples so that the first element becomes the second one and the second element becomes the first one. Okay, so in this case, if I were to flip everything, okay, so let's, let's take a look at what happens when I flip everything. So this is F inverse, making out of this one. So I just flip the order, right? But that is not a function because in this case, you know, the codomain, becomes the domain, the original codomain becomes the domain. So that means, you know, in this case, the domain, domain is this thing here. The co, oops, okay, I cannot, cannot spell. Codomain is this thing here. So you can, if, if I were to look at the domain as ABC, and the codomain as 1, 2, then F inverse is not even a function because one element in the domain, which is C, does not map to anything. 
So that makes it not even a function. If it's not a function, I cannot tell, I cannot say whether it's an injection or surjection because it's not a function to begin with. Yep. Okay, so so you need to if you need to do a surgery to the original function, yeah. then it is not um, bijection. Oh yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. I'm just yeah. 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 So in this context, you know, bijection means you know, if I give you the result after applying the function, I can tell you how I got there to begin with. If I know the f if I know the value of f of x, I can reverse the whole thing and find what out find out what x is. Are we doing okay so far with this? Sort of, maybe. All right. Now, so the question is, why are we talking about this? Okay, so there's a reference here. Recall that at the end of module 0289, so when you're reading this module, hopefully you did, or will, <laughs> or are, do, are doing it right now. So when you encounter something like that, what do you do? You go like, do you go like, yeah, I think I know what is at the end of module 0289, or do you actually go back and take a look at the end of module 0289? I hope you go back <laughs> and not just make the assumption of, yeah, I think I remember what that was, okay? So the idea of you know, the end of module 0289, which is the module that talks about functions to begin with, was how do I write a single condition? to say that if this condition is met, then whatever algorithm did this to the array is a proper sorting algorithm. That was the question. That was the, the question at the end of the previous module, which is you know, 0, 2, 8, 9, okay? But I also mentioned, at least in the module, that we're missing one little thing that makes it not possible to make that qualification. That qualification turned out to be bijective. Okay, what is a bijection? So now we have this tool, this extra term, okay, called bijection. I can now actually express that. Okay, so I'm going to go through some time here to kind of talk about the notation that is needed in order to say if this is the initial condition and this is the exit condition, then whatever is causing the final you know, state can be called a sorting algorithm. Okay, so we're going to do that. All right, so I'm gonna use this, switch back to my last note. There we go. Oh, this is not, this is not what I want. Okay, do. Go back to files, go to, nope. Okay, go to notes, go to ARC 440, and this one, there we go. All right. All right, so what we're gonna do is to write the entire thing. So we have to start with, okay, the initial condition. So the initial condition is really just a bunch of definitions so that we have some terms predefined, okay? So for simplicity, I'm gonna say n is um, the length of array a, okay? You know, instead of using you know, a dot, length or anything like that, which is kind of verbose. I'm just going to use and to represent that, okay? And I'm going to say you know, for all i, and this is a uh, notation to mean a range of integer values. Um, I actually looked this up, and apparently if you use the double square bracket to mean the inclusive you know, beginning and double and you know, um, bracket to mean the uh, inclusive end of the other side, you can use it to specify a set of integers. So in this case, the set of integers that I want to include 
is starting from zero and ending with n minus one. So once again, you know, the square bracket is really here you know, just to make it easier to specify a range of integer values, okay? So when I, whenever i is within this range, I'm just, this is just notation, k of i is a bracket i. In other words, I'm using k of i to remember the initial value of a bracket i. And this is the entry, um, uh, this is the initial condition, okay? Before the sorting algorithm was run, you know, these are the things that I know. It doesn't have to be in order, okay? I just need a name for each value in the entire array. So the next question that someone may have is, can we have duplicate values? Yeah, we can have duplicate values, not a problem. There's nothing here that says you know, the K of I's cannot be the same. So they can have duplicate items, not a problem. Okay, so now the final condition, okay, the final condition after you run the algorithm, what do we want to be true in order for the algorithm to be called a sorting algorithm? That is the question. So the first one is pretty easy, okay? The first one is easy to understand. So we say for all i in your double square bracket from zero to n minus two, close double square bracket, and we want a bracket i to be less than or equal to a bracket i plus one. This we have seen already, okay? It simply means your know, one element in the array is less than or equal to the next element in the array. So I'm looking for an array that is sorted in non-decreasing order. It can handle, you know, um, elements of the same value. That is not a problem, okay? So this is important, but it is not the only one that is important, okay? So I'm gonna say, okay, we need this, but in order to prevent, you know, cheaters like TAC, which just initialize the entire array to zero to meet this particular requirement, I'm gonna say, you know, Every value that we started off with must be found in one of the elements in the codomain. Okay, so how do we express that? Okay, so this is going to be a little bit longer. Okay, so we're going to say there exists a function f, and this function f you know, maps um, you know, basically indexes, all the valid indexes. So the domain is from zero to n minus one. The codomain is also from zero to n minus one. Is that okay? So all this is saying is, you know, there has to exist at least one function like this. Now, can there be multiple functions like this? Well, kind of depends. If the values of the um, array elements was unique to begin with, then there's exactly one function that can do this. On the other hand, if you have duplicate values in the initial values of the array, then you can have multiple functions that also meet this same requirement, okay? Um, so we're gonna say f is a bijection, okay? And then some more, okay? There's another thing, okay? f has to be a bijection. So the last one has to express and say, you know, everything, you know, assuming this is an in-place sorting algorithm, every value at the end of the algorithm, every value in the array after the algorithm runs, has to map to one and only one thing of the case. Okay? So the way that we say this is for all i in the valid range of indexes, which is from zero to n minus one, the following has to be true. After we run the algorithm, a bracket i has to be exactly the same as k of f of i. Close, okay, and then close this parentheses, this one, and I think that's it, okay. All right. Yes. So, why did you 
Well, if it's not an in-place sort algorithm, then you know the when you end here, then you have to change this letter A to whatever the new array is. So yes, it can easily work with a non-in-place sort, but with an in-place sort, because you you have the same array, so that means you know, the end value of inside array A has to meet this requirement. So what is the special thing about this entire discussion? It is the application of f of i as the index of k. So every value in the array after the algorithm is done has to equal to exactly one value of the constant, which is the initial value of the array before you ran the algorithm. And the most important part here is f has to be a bijection, which means we are not missing anything. Is that making sense or not? Yes. The second line. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't what again? Sorry. Um, if I assign everything to one value, it would have failed this condition here, because you know some of the initial values would not be found in the final values of the array after the algorithm has run. Okay, all right. So if this looks awfully confusing, it's actually not a bad thing. Okay, realizing this is looking confusing, you know, it's not a bad thing. So what are you going to do? Okay, let's just say that, that you're taking this as an online class, and I am as irresponsible as I can possibly be, which means you know at the beginning of the semester I just reset the dates of all the homework assignments and I just walk away. I'm on the I'm on a vac I'm on vacation in Taiwan. So what are you going to do if this if that was how I teach this class? Come on, you guys. This is, a, this is a technique of how to understand something, how to study, okay? So without the instructor being interactive and trying to answer your questions, having office hour, and so on, what are you going to do if you are the one reading a book? And this is what the book has introduced so far. What are you gonna do? What is one of the easiest way to understand a concept? Online research. That may be difficult because I just came up with this stuff here. <laughs> so finding what words to search for, you know, may be a little bit difficult. Examples, okay? Make examples so that you can actually visualize and see all this, okay? So that's exactly what I'm going to do, okay? All right. So I'll, I'll give you an example, you know, where A0 starts off with a value of 2, A1 starts off with a, with a value of one, and then A2 uh, is going to be two again, okay? So this is an array of three elements, which means your know, N in this case is three, and it is clearly not in order yet, right? So I'm gonna have, I have to sort it. I don't even care about the sorting algorithm. For all I care, it can be a pixie, you know, you know, doing magic stuff, you know, in the computer, sorting the algorithm. The only thing I care about is how do I express the correct result after the algorithm is done, okay? So you guys probably know that, oh, pff, that's easy to sort. After we are, we are done sorting, A bracket zero should be a one, A bracket one should be a two, and A bracket two should be a two, two, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so we start with this, we end with this. So now the question is, what about F? Okay, what would F looks, look like? So you have to remember, this is also known as K0, this is known as K1, this is known as K2. Okay, so K0, K1, K2 are really just a notation so that I remember what was at the first you know, position of the array, what was at the second position of the array, and what was at the third position of the array. So now I need something to do the mapping. I need this function. So can someone tell me one 
example of that function because this is the time when you can have at least two functions to do the same thing. They're both that bijection. They both you know, serve the same purpose because I have two elements that are twos. So I can choose which way to map them you know, in the end. All right, so I'm going to give you one example. Okay, so f, one example of f is, um, you know, whatever, oops, okay, I touched the one portion of the screen and it thinks I was erasing. Okay, so zero maps to, hmm. all right, so let's find out what you know, zero needs to map to. So if this is zero, this would be zero. So a bracket zero ends up to be this thing here. So what, which k has a value of one? k of, k of one, okay. So very good, okay. The second one is one comma something. In other words, I am looking at this i being one and it ends up with a value of two. So this is where you have a little bit of flexibility because there are two k of something that has a value of two. k of zero has a value of two. k of two also has a value of two. Take your pick. I'm gonna pick zero first, okay? So one map to zero. And then what about two? Okay, well, you got some choices here. In other words, I look at a of two, it also needs to be a value of two. The question is, which k has a value of two? You go like, but Jack, you just you know, mentioned this earlier. k of zero has a value of two, so just put a zero here. Don't write it down, okay? Because I'm gonna fix it. So yes, this function will work, but it's not a bijection, is it? So I'm going to test you guys on concepts about bijection. Why is this function not a bijection? Um, I know what you mean, but you can uh, say it in a more specific way. <laughs> so what is unique and what is not unique? or the mapping is not, be, it's not between the sets, it is between elements of the sets. Um, he had his hand up a little bit earlier, so I'm gonna let you know, him give it a try first. Go ahead. Okay, and in this case, why is that not true? They both map to zero, okay. Exactly. Yep. So the way you mentioned the more general description is more um, precise, you know, because you refer to the element of the domain mapping to unique elements if the, in the codomain. So it's not the domain mapping to the codomain. It is the elements mapping to the elements and whether that is unique or not. Okay. So, you yeah, I know I'm splitting hair here and I, I know it can be very annoying to some people, but in a class like this, it is necessary, okay? The, the precision of the language needs to be, uh, is important. So the bottom line is one maps to zero, two also maps to zero, and therefore it is not an injection. If it's not an injection, can it be a bijection? Nope, cannot, because you need both injection and surjection in order to become a bijection. So that's why I told you guys not to copy this earlier, because now I have to go back and say, eh, this doesn't work, but this will work, right? Because a bracket two, when everything is said and done, needs to have a value of two. The question is, which k has a value of two? Well, we got two, k zero is two, but we cannot use it because if we use that one, then the function would not have been bijection, would not have been a bijection, but we can use this one. See, k two also has a value of two. So I can now change this to two, and now this f is a bijection. Are we good so far? Okay, but 
when I said there exists an F blah, 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 okay, that implies may not be the only one, okay? Because all this says is there has to exist at least one set, okay, which serves as a bijection between those two, the domain and the codomain, but it doesn't say that it has to be the only one. So there's another way to do this. So the other way to do this, the alternative is zero, one, one, oops, okay, I keep touching the bottom, one, two, and two, zero. That would also be a bijection, and it would also meet all the requirements that we have specified, because the values of the array was not unique to begin with. Are we doing okay so far with this discussion? So this is an example that you can use to you know, kind of understand how the function f is utilized in this case and why it has to be a bijection. Because if it's not a bijection, that means we can map multiple things to the same place, which also means you know, that may not describe that the function is, I mean, the algorithm is actually sorting because you can end up with more duplicate items than what, it, than what we started off with. Yes, please. <laughs> I like splitting here. Uh, the statement you've made now is not that each value of the array is mapped to an address in the same place, but each address of the array is mapped to an address. Otherwise, you could have a function that was non bijective. And if we have arrays, we have certain algorithms that do just that. Say that one more time. So in the, at the end of uh, 289, mm -hmm. you say we need to define a criterion. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that each original value of array element is found in a separate array. But what we did here, and specifically to make it digestive, is we didn't check the value for checking the address of the original array. We just pointed out as having case zero. The positions, zero. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is more specific than what was asked at the end of 0289. Yes, and that mm -hmm. we potentially have a sorting algorithm that actually sorts and did lead to sorting array. Mm. No. In terms of defining criterion, it is copy, it is copy that through into two addresses and have a separate array that maps the values to not the uh, address of the array. Like if you if you had a if you ever had a function that went through and keeps checking the value of the array that it duplicates, it would send the array address that you didn't check to the uh, you didn't like copy it or anything. Okay. Like you had a, a I think I. Okay, I think I vaguely understand what you're saying, but I think the you know, graphical way to look at this is we are looking at this map. Yeah. This is one way. And then the other way, if you look at it more graphically, is to have this two over here, this two over here, but this one has to be here. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I was mostly just pointing out that you just like the said. Mm hmm. This is more specific, and this is actually the correct way to do it. What was described at the end of 0289 was not complete, was incomplete. Yep, very good. All right. All right, so getting back to hair splitting, okay, sounds like a conditioner com commercial. <laughs> Why are we splitting hair? From a pragmatic perspective, okay, you guys are all gonna be moving on to a computer science program or a computer engineering program, and we have AI to help you do all kinds of stuff now. So why is it still important to split hair, and why is it still important to use <laughs> notations, cryptic notations like this? Okay, I think you beat him by like a split second. <laughs> Basically, by getting more and more specific, there is less room for error. Mm -hmm. You basically just describe it in greater detail like this. Right. There's no okay. room for interpretation. And, but why is that important? Because there's no room for interpretation to have a dot in the middle of their address. <laughs> okay, imagine you are the boss okay, of a software company, and you have an entire team of developers, okay? Um, so maybe not the entire, so you're not the boss of the entire company, but you're in charge of a project. 
and you have some developers you know, that can help you with actually getting the code done. How are you going to specify the deliverable that your developers are supposed to deliver? That is the important part, right? Because you know, from the developer's perspective, this is important too, because you know, they can just magically develop an algorithm. But at the end of the day, how do they make sure that the algorithm does what it's supposed to? Uh, you have test engineer in the company, and their only job is to look at the specification of that portion of a project and make sure the code does exactly that. Okay, so being able to specify, okay, being able to specify this stuff here in a very precise language that actually does describe what the product is supposed to do is really important. You can have the AI to help you, but the AI cannot understand you know, exactly what you mean if you try to describe all this stuff in plain English. I give you guys this challenge. Just try. <laughs> try to describe all of this stuff here in plain English. Because you know, that's what ChatGPT understands. I don't think, well, okay, you guys can test this and correct me, but I don't think ChatGDP understands mathematical notations like these. There's no way to enter that in a way that ChatGPT understands. There's one thing that is missing in natural languages that automatically leads to all kinds of confusion. It's, it's the very simple concept of parentheses. Give, give me one example of a natural language where nesting is explicit in the language itself. I can think of none, but then I only know two languages, so I'm, but yeah, go ahead. That's okay. Specify like you start a thought and then interject it with the specification of the comma and then animate the comma and then continue the thought. And then you can say said thought. Yeah. You know, you can you you can you have to define variables to label a previous concept, and we call that legalese. <laughs> because in legal you know documents we cannot afford to have ambiguity, and yet guess what they do. So you know, um, so I'm trying to say is you know natural languages are not very precise. That's not the intention of those of natural languages. But if you are to tell the computer what is the objective, you know, of a certain algorithm or a certain project, you know, then it becomes really important to be you know uh, precise and also you know concise would be nice too. But I will settle for just your know, precision. All right, so I'm going to take roll. You know, I think people who are not showing up now probably won't show up today. And you know, I'm going to, yeah, I'm not going to say any more. All right, so I'm going to hide the activity. And this time, I make the uh, due date late enough that it should not matter. I'm using Dragon because you know, um, the upcoming lunar year is the year of the dragon. All right, so I'm assuming most of you, okay, I'm gonna maybe write it down on the whiteboard too, just in case someone is not catching that. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the notes, you know, because I think what is important in today's discussion, I mean, the subject matter is one of them, okay? But that's not the only one. The other one is how to read the module. You know, it's not just, you know, oh, I'm just reading it sentence by sentence. I seem to recognize every single word. I think I got this. Okay. You have to really kind of connect the concepts. What is, con what, you know, every single sentence 
is something that you have to kind of think a little bit deeper, think of some examples. Do I understand this concept? Can I think of examples to illustrate that concept? That's kind of you know, what I'm trying to express here is you know, you know, reading the content is not as simple as some people think it is. All right. Okay. So I'll be I'll be good with those concepts. You know, bijection, which is derived from derived from injection and surjection, and in order for something to be an injection or surjection, it has to be a function first. A function has to be a subset of the Cartesian product of the domain and the codomain, and you know, and then we have to understand what is the Cartesian product and stuff like that. So is that all kind of connecting right now? Do do we have any questions? About any one of those connections. Nope. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do next is to open up a new module. It's called Aleph Null, and this is a fun one. This is a fun, fun topic. Okay. So in my case, it is under CISP four forty, and it's called Aleph Null, which is module zero two nine three. There we go. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna you know kind of spell out here is, hmm. Okay, so we know that this is representing the set of all natural numbers, and this is representing the set of all integers, right? So if I were to ask you, do you think they have the same number of elements? What do you think the answer is? That is a very tricky question, by the way. Because first of all, there's an infinite number of natural numbers, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Okay, it just keeps going and going, but in one direction. Integers can go in both directions. So in one direction is zero, one, two, three, four, goes all the way, and then the other direction is zero, negative one, negative two, and it goes to, you know, goes to infinity on in the other direction too. So if I ask you, how do you compare their cardinality? In other words, I'm looking at the cardinality of each one, and I want a relational operator that is true between them, meaning less than, equal to, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, blah, blah, blah. What do you think that is? Now, this is a particularly tricky case because one is a proper subset of the other one too. So can someone tell me which one is a proper subset of which one? Okay, I cannot tell which one who who comes first. I think we we have to install buttons on these your know, desks, and then on my terminal here, I can actually, it would just light up. You know, whoever pressed the button first. I'm gonna say you know, Cameron, you know, press the button first. That's right. Okay, so. So we know that this is true. Okay, the set of all natural number is a proper subset of the set of all integers. It makes sense, right? Every natural number is an integer, but negative one is not a natural number, and yet it is an integer. So that meets the requirement of you know a proper subset of. Okay, so if n is a proper subset of z. Then it kind of makes sense, okay? Intuitively, it makes sense to say that the cardinality of n is less than the cardinality of z because there are certain things missing in the set of natural numbers, and yet that is not the case because you cannot really compare infinity to infinity. There are not actual numbers that can be compared. Is that okay? You go like, and what do we do with this? Okay, I'll give you the answer first, and then we'll go explain why the answer is the answer. They turn out to be the same. You're like, what? And they're both called Aleph No, and I cannot remember how to write the symbol Aleph, so I'm, I have to cheat a little bit here. Okay, I know it looks really ugly, you know, for for people who you know see that as a alphabet in your Native language, but I do apologize that I'm butchering, you know, you know, letters from alphabets from other languages. But you know, close enough. Here, okay. Then you go like, 
I don't see how that is the case. Okay. So as it turns out, the way we define equality of cardinality between two sets is whether there's a bijection between them. If there exists a bijection between two sets, then we say that they have the same cardinality. Okay, let me say that one more time. I'm gonna write it out here. Okay, so we say that if there exists a function going between these two sets, so I'm just gonna be very specific here. Um, okay, if there's a function like this and f is a bijection, you can also say, you know, and f is bijective, okay, because f is a function, then the cardinality of n equals to the cardinality of z. This is how we compare cardinality between sets. Yep. <laughs> Why? The, the key is they are both infinitely large. Now, in this case, you know, I have to be more specific about the quote unquote infinity, inf infinitely large. They're both countably inf infinitely large. Okay, the key word here is countably. Okay, all right, so before we go any further, Let's find that function first, okay? The bijective function that maps from natural numbers to um, integers. Well, that one is not too hard, right? You know, if you want a bijective function, well, okay, I take it back. That's actually harder than you think it is. If I were to find a bijective function, okay? The keyword here is not just injective, but bijective. If I were to find a bijective function that maps natural numbers to integers, it's actually not very straightforward. Now, if you have read the notes already, you go like, yeah, I know the answer already because it really is in the notes. But if you have not read the notes, then go like, huh, it really is kind of hard. Injective, easy, okay? If I really just need, need it to be inject, injective, I can just say f of x is x, <laughs> done, right? Because you know, that's going to map 0 to 0. It's going to map 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3. Definitely injective. I'm not going to map two natural numbers to the same integer. Easy peasy. But if I want it to be also surjective, then it goes like, how do we do that? Because now I have to map natural numbers to also to the negative side of integers. So as it turns out, all you have to do is to say, even numbers go here, odd numbers go the other side, or the other way around, doesn't matter. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what we do in this case, okay, so if I were to work out this particular f here, I can say, um, I can define f like this, okay? f of x is, first of all, decide whether that is odd or not, okay? So we just say x mod two, equals to zero, okay? If it is, we are gonna map it to the non-negative side of integers, but we have to do something about the math first. So we have to do, hmm, okay, let me think about this. So we're gonna say x divided by two. Otherwise, we, we wanna map it to the um, negative side, so that means that you know, we have one, three, five, and so on mapping to the negative side. So the way to do that is add one first divided by negative two, okay? So we have x plus one, the whole thing divided by negative two. So this is a ternary expression. I hope you guys are starting to get familiarized with the ternary expression because I use it a lot. That's one of my favorite things to you know, use you know, in the right you know, context. This is the right context. Okay, so let's see whether you guys can work this out. Um, what is f of 17? Is negative what? 
negative 9 because you know, 17 mod 2 equals to 0 is false. We go to this expression here. So we have 17 plus 1, which is 9, 18. 18 divided by negative 2 is indeed negative 9. Okay, very good. And what about f of 16? 8, okay, very good. And what about f of 19? Negative 10, oh, okay. So that means, you know, all with all the natural numbers, uh, for the even ones, I map it to one half of its value as integers. For the odd ones, I add one to it first and then divide it by negative two and then map it to the negative side of the integers. So intuitively, is this function bijective? Well, let's start with injective, okay? Let's start with injection. Does this function look injective to you? In other words, given two different x, we are not going to map to the same thing. I think you know, just based on algebra, you have an intuitive sense that, yeah, pretty, pretty sure this one is, is injective. The tricky part is, what about surjective? Meaning, is everything in the codomain mapped to? Can you find me a specific integer that does not have a corresponding natural number? The answer is no, okay? You know, the reason why we know that, or intuitively we know that, case, that is the case, is because when we start with zero as a natural number and move you know, in on the greater side of the natural numbers, we are basically just alternating between the negative and the positive side like this. So that means intuitively, we just have to kind of keep doing this, bounce back and forth until we find the one that we want to map to. And it's going to correspond to a particular natural number. Okay, so it's just intuitive. This is not a mathematical proof, but intuitively, <coughs> it is also surjective. So that means it's a bijection. Bije if it's a bijection, it means there has to be an inverse function as well. Meaning, if I give you a integer, you can map it back to the natural number that this function map it to, you know, in the first place. So I will say, I'll give you a number, okay? Seven. What natural number maps to seven? That's an easy one. Seven is a, on the positive side, which means the natural number is even, and it's going to be 14. Very good. What about negative five? Negative five is on the negative side, which means it would be it would have been an odd number that maps to it. So what plus one divided by negative two would give me negative five? Come on, your algebra. Nine, exactly. Because nine plus one is 10, 10 divided by negative two is negative five. So I hope you know, this is convincing you that there's also an inverse function to this entire thing. We are only left with uh, three minutes, okay? But the fun part of this particular module goes a little bit further, and it has to do with a two-dimensional mapping in section five, okay? So in section five, I'm asking about the, natural, the set of natural numbers, okay? What is their cardinality? And then I'm also looking into the Cartesian product between natural numbers. So I'm, I'm trying to compare the cardinality of these two sets. In other words, on one hand, I have a number line like that. On the other side, we have a two-dimensional space. You know, basically, this, it's the same as you count pixels, the way you um, have coordinates of pixels on the screen. It's two-dimensional. So the question is, hmm, how do we compare their cardinality? I'll give you a spoiler, but you have to read the module before Wednesday. And by the way, there's a homework assignment due on Wednesday too, okay? So keep that in mind. As it turns out, they are the same. You go like, huh, what about the you know, uh, natural number, Cartesian product with natural number, Cartesian product with natural number? Same, if you give me the, a fixed dimension, 
and each dimension is just natural number, they can all fold to just natural numbers. And it's a bijection that is doing the folding. Isn't that kind of fun? I think it's kind of fun. Because you're basically looking at a two-dimensional space and go like, yeah, we can linearize this two-dimensional space into the, the natural number line. It's like, what? OK. So the rest of this module talks about you know, what the function looks like. You know, these are the resulting values you know, that you see right here. And then it goes through um, derivations. Okay? And looks, it looks kind of ugly like this. But this is the important part. Okay? You know, I could have just given you the definitions, you know, the, the end result of the derivations, and call it a day. It would have saved me a lot of time of typing all this stuff out. Can you kind of imagine how long it takes to type this stuff out? <clears throat> just right click on it and find the LaTeX you know, format. That's exactly what I used to type it. So the reason why I do all the derivation is to show you how to reason things out using things that you already know. Because I think in the end, that is far more important than just knowledge. It is your ability to think, to analyze, and formulate an answer, a solution, that is going to be much more important than just what you already know. Because if you know how to derive things, you don't have to worry about not being able to get to the result. But if you only know the result but don't know how to derive it, then you're kind of stuck. And guess what? AI can do most of that already. So I'm trying to get you guys into the thinking mode so that by the time you try, you try to get a job, you can beat you know, the AI. You know how to beat AI because you can outthink AI. You cannot outknow AI. You cannot even outknow Google, your know, search engines. So focus on the thinking part, how to solve problems. All right, so with that all said, remember homework assignment due on Wednesday and finish reading this particular module, hopefully, and then I'll go through the explanation on Wednesday. All right, see you all on Wednesday.